Thank you, everyone. And uh, welcome to our weekly webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items as always. You can uh, send us questions and we'll take them live. You can submit them um, in the Q&A box. And as always, the presentation is being recorded and will be posted on our website. And um, so again, this uh, actually a typo on this slide, it's November 12th, I'm sorry. The, these weeks go by so fast, but it's always great to meet with you on a weekly basis. So today it's the webinar on November 12th. Uh, and, and once again, it's phenomenal to, uh, to be here with colleagues. I'm here with Dr. Sukovic, the PI of the trial, as well as Catherine and Alison, our wonderful patient navigators, and they'll speak later. Um, let's get started and, and jump to the agenda. Uh, as always, and as requested, by the patient community. We're committed to providing weekly enrollment updates to the community and we'll tackle your questions. Uh, we receive a number of questions every week uh, and so uh, we, we tend to change the slides a little bit uh, based on the questions that we received. And so today we're going to focus a little bit on supplements as well as the patient navigator and the enrollment process uh, based on your questions. But of course we will have time for your questions live today as well. Next slide. For those of you who may be new uh, to this program, as you know, we are, we're doing all of this to, uh, to accelerate the time it takes to develop new treatments for ALS. Uh, and in order to do so, rather than testing one treatment at a time, we decided to build an optimized infrastructure that's open and can uh, be sustained long term so that we can continue to test multiple treatments, not just one at a time, but many at the same time, and also continue to add treatments. In fact, we started with three of them, treatments A, B, and C in July, and we are now adding the fourth, treatment D. Next slide. So this is a schema of our current uh, platform. So it's again a perpetual adaptive trial, meaning that it's going to be going on uh, for a very long time and it can change over time. For example, it can accommodate new treatments. Uh, we are testing multiple drugs in parallel, not in the same person, but in parallel groups of individuals with ALS. Every treatment is called a regimen on the slide. So we have regimens A, B, and C, which we are enrolling for at this time. And those regimens are Zedlucoplan, Verdiperstat, and CNMA U8. And we are literally uh, any day, uh, just a few days away from starting and launching the fourth regimen, regimen D, that's pre in. Uh, we received clearance from the FDA, IRB approval, and we are just in the final stages of startup. So uh, that's coming up very soon. Uh, the randomization ratio is three to one in favor of active, uh, which means that for every four people who enter the trial, three will receive active drug and only one placebo. And that's true for every regimen. Uh, so a few people asked us what happens when new regimens are added. Well, actually the same uh, regimen uh, the schema, the same uh, concept applies also for new regimens as they are um, uh, added. And actually uh, what we found was that adding regimens is really a very streamlined process, which is exactly what we were expecting. And it was, it was wonderful to see it you know, in real life uh, because when we added the, the fourth regimen, Regimen, regimen D uh, for both the FDA and the IRB, uh, everything was streamlined. Uh, and again, we're uh, we able to essentially jumpstart this uh, fourth regimen based on the great work uh, that we've done for regimens A, B, and C. And if you could click one more time, an important part of the project is that in addition to the placebo control period, which lasts about six months, participants who complete that uh, the period of treatment, uh, they will be offered the opportunity to move on to an open label extension for several months, which means that they will receive active drug regardless of whether they received active or placebo during the preceding six months. Next slide. So at, at this time, uh, we are enrolling participants at 29 sites. Now, as you know, we selected more than those, uh, over 50 sites, uh, and uh, we are now at uh, 49 sites approved by the IRB. So they are just working on the very final stages of activation. And the goal is to activate uh, all of this uh, soon. Uh, and also we're issuing a new request for interest from sites. So we, we will add even more in addition to the initial group in early 2021. Uh, if you would like to connect with your site, you can find their contact information. And also, uh, we also list the ones that are active uh, um, on, on our website, and that's the link. 
in terms of the actual screening process, I know some of you asked, uh, how does, you know, what's the next step, I guess, once you go to our website and identify a site near you. So the next step would be to contact that site uh, to begin sort of the screening process that's managed locally by site staff. So it depends on local resources, obviously, uh, how many people that can accommodate at any given time. So uh, you can be in touch with uh, the site and, and also please uh, discuss that with your doctor and your care team. Uh, they might be able to um, identify, uh, again, the, the best match for you. Next slide. So at this point, we have um, consented, meaning that um, we have enrolled 190 people who signed informed consent. Of those, 139 were assigned to a regimen, and 113 are currently receiving studied drug, meaning either active or placebo. That's distributed essentially equally across the three active regimens that are currently enrolling. And as I said earlier, number four will be activated very soon. So when that starts, uh, people will be randomly assigned to any of the four uh, drugs in the platform at that time. Next slide. So here I wanted to briefly review, uh, because I know every week we get a, a few questions about supplements and interventions. So I wanted to review first the guiding principles and then some specific information. And I know that Katrin and Alison as patient navigators have been receiving a lot of questions about uh, you know, supplements and interventions. So the guiding principles here are that any supplements or medications or interventions that are in a separate ALS trial are considered exclusionary. There might be a few other supplements and medications that might be exclusionary based on specific safety concerns or interactions with the treatment under evaluation. That's true for the vast majority of trials, although different trials might have a different list. Now for this trial, we carefully curated the list of supplements and interventions that are currently tested in other ALS trials. And so the, the list essentially uh, includes those that are actively being tested in other trials. Uh, and of note, some of the, the, the questions that we receive often are about TADCA, sodium phenylbutyrate, curcumin, and high doses of methylcobalamin. So those uh, interventions are actually considered experimental because at this time they're still being tested in a separate trial. And that's why they are not allowed when people participate in the platform trial. Now, obviously this list might change as things might, you know, new trials might open, others might end. If people are on these medications, they can always wash out. And, and there is a washout period that's either 30 days or five half lives, if known, whichever is longer. So max is 30 days, uh, unless uh, we, we have a very long half life, which is unlikely. So essentially uh, we, 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 people can wash out and then still participate in the platform trial. Another frequently asked question is what happens if any of these drugs gets approved and become standard of care? So in, in those cases, they would become, they would basically be in the same category as Riluzol and Edaravon. So for our trial, we are allowing standard of care, meaning that people can receive FDA approved medications such as Riluzol and Edaravon. If any other drugs on the slide or other drugs that are currently in trial get approved by the FDA, then they would be allowed uh, for participants in the trial. Next slide. Few other questions we have received are about stem cells and treatments for familial ALS. So if someone was in a, in a trial or received off-label stem cells, either via intrathecal or intravenous administration, that would be allowed as long as there is appropriate washout, just like the supplements or medications I mentioned earlier. Specifically, if somebody received brainstorm or neuron, but there's been appropriate washout, in other words, they're not currently receiving those interventions uh, and there's been washout, then they will be allowed in the study. The use of stem cells via direct injection into the brain or the spinal cord is a little bit different because when you do that, you actually inject the cells inside the central nervous system. Uh, and so that would cause, um, again, a permanent change in the physiology and the structure of the central nervous system. So th that those type of stem cells would be exclusionary. Th those are more rare to be found uh, because the, the majority of stem cells are generally given via intrathecal, meaning into, into the uh, spinal fluid or intravenous administration. In terms of treatment for familial ALS, 
prior use of antisense oligonucleotides is allowed after appropriate washout. So the antisense oligonucleotides that are currently in trial for SOD1, FAS, or, or C9 would be allowed um, after appropriate washout. However, if somebody were to get gene therapies, meaning viral mediated uh, treatments, uh, those would permanently implant or, or integrate uh, into the, the, the recipient. And so that would be exclusionary. Next slide. This slide is a little bit different. It's a little bit busy. I'm not gonna go over that in detail. This is a list though, of things that are allowed actually, as long as you remain within the dosing limits or for, for the indications described, and we don't require a washout. So things that we've been asked about, for example, Diana's protocol that would be allowed and there's no required washout uh, or mexilatin if given for muscle muscle cramps within certain dosages that will be allowed, cannabinoids will be allowed. So again, this is just for your future reference. I, uh, again, I, I don't know that we have to spend too much time now, but all the slides and all the recordings will be posted on the website. So you're welcome to go back to this and, and review this in detail. Next slide. And now I wanted to introduce uh, Catherine and, and, and Alison, because obviously we're sharing a lot of information and it's hard to digest within a short webinar, even if you come to many different webinars, we want to offer you additional resources. So in addition to asking questions now, please feel free to always contact Catherine and Alison, uh, uh, either by phone or email, and now I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, they are available to ask questions, um, you know, outside of these webinars as well. Uh, so feel free to contact them anytime. Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Small. I am the patient navigator for the Healy platform trial. Um, and so that phone number and the email address that you see on the screen there, I monitor um, all throughout the day. So I've got that constantly open on my computer and I'm here to field any questions that you have about the trial. So my goal is to understand this trial inside and out so that I can answer questions, you know, whether it's a general question about the trial or if it's site specific. Um, absolutely feel free to leave a voicemail or send an email my way. And you don't answer phone in real time, right? Because you're working remotely, is that correct? Right, exactly. So while I can't pick up the phone in real time while working remotely, I do listen to the voicemails and um, I'll give you a call back as, as soon as I can or after consulting with my team members. Thank you. And Alison? Thank you. Yes, my name is Allison, and for anybody who might be joining us for the first time today, welcome. It's very nice to meet you. Um, I'm honored to be here as I lost my husband to ALS, and I know firsthand what a difficult journey that is, as well as how critical clinical research is to our whole community. So I'm very excited to be part of the Healy team, and I'll be focusing on creating and ensuring a positive experience for any interested potential participation participants in the trial. So if you run across any issues or challenges or you have a great experience that you'd like to share, please feel free to reach out to Catherine and to me at any time. We're happy to help and we'd love to share in those great experiences you're having as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. And next slide. Um, this is just a reminder that we will continue to have weekly informal Q&As and monthly webinars. Uh, obviously, if you're here, you know the, the link, but please feel free to share it with everyone and post it on social media. Uh, in addition to the schedule, you can find the, the recordings, the slide decks um, on our website, so you can use them for future res reference. And I also want to emphasize that we are planning also different webinars uh, about the science that supports each of the drugs that's in the platform trial. So we'll talk more about each drug's mechanism and you'll have an opportunity to interact and ask questions to the scientists uh, the companies that develop these drugs. So, uh, you know, if, if you have questions about those, we do have some material on our website, but again, we're planning um, some, some dedicated webinars so that you can ask questions and the scientists will be online. Great, that was the last slide. So I think now, you know, we do have some time for questions. Yes, so please, people want to put it in the chat or the QA um, that we can try to get, uh, get through uh, all of them. And while people type, um, Alison or Catherine, do you have any uh, frequently asked questions? I know sometimes uh, you you know you you receive many and you interact with the community. But I, uh, oh yes, no, there's actually uh, questions already. Well, go ahead and answer that one, and then I'll read uh, the questions. 
Catherine or Allison, do you want to answer Sabrina's question? Yeah, so you have any, any frequently asked questions or anything you would want to share to start? Um, well, one thing I would say, and I'll turn over to Catherine, is I know that we hear a lot, I you know people are anxious for their sites near them to open up and we are moving as quickly as possible and have a lot of sites that are near to becoming active. So if you're um, frustrated or not hearing back as quickly as you'd like, please reach out to us. We're happy to help and give you whatever information that we can. So there's a question here about what does the newest drug uh, target? Uh, I'm happy to answer that one. Uh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, so the new drug is called predopidine. None of these drugs have good names. And uh, what we call Sigma-1 agonist. So uh, Sigma-1 um, is, is um, an important receptor on our neurons. And uh, we, we think it works by a couple different mechanisms. And I'll tell you that the preclinical data for this was, was very exciting. And that's what we're going to show in an upcoming webinar. So there's, there's uh, abnormality in pe people with ALS and their motor neurons on something called a nuclear pore. So we all have our, our genetic material, our DNA, that's in our cells that, that's surrounded by something called a nuclear membrane. And what has been found by several scientists is that there are almost like holes in that nuclear membrane. So there, it's called a nuclear pore. So it's leaky so that the genetic material, instead of staying in that nice nucleus or in that nice uh, circle or sphere, leaks out into the surrounding uh, part of the cell called the cytoplasm. And we think that that starts that whole pathway of protein aggregation or, um, and, and causes cell damage. So one of the ways that the predopidine drug works is by uh, repairing that defect in that nuclear pore. So that's, um, that's exciting um, and it's a relatively new uh, target and so we're excited about that approach. Um, it also has data that it, it helps um, motor neurons survive um, by increasing levels of certain growth factors that are important for motor neuron survival. Um, so those are two of the mechanisms. Um, it's been tried in a different um, neurodegenerative disease, Huntington's disease, and uh, had actually positive results in, a, in an early phase trial there. And um, the other important thing is, um, and why, one of the reasons we also picked them, is that they have done a lot of work to show that the drug gets into the brain at the dose that we're giving and actually works on the Sigma-1 agonist. So we know that it's delivered to the right place, it's working on the right target, and it's having a biological effect. But we, we are going to have them come and give a, a talk. We're going to have all four of the companies do it. And the reason why we're not doing that like tomorrow, because that would be very exciting, is that we do have to get those slides reviewed by the central IRB, the ethics review, and that's important. Anytime we have a webinar where we're, um, the, the results might be recruiting people into trial, the, the central ethics review board has to look at those slides. So they, they do it very quickly in a day or two, but, but the, um, all four of the companies are preparing those presentations and, and then we'll submit them and we'll, we'll uh, have a series of these mini webinars to share that science. How do you spell that there? Well, I'm going to answer that one live because I can't spell uh, without writing very easily. Um, but I'll, I'll type that in for everybody. Yeah. And the question is, is whether the new drug is a pill, liquid or injection, it's a pill. One thing I would just say that's really important is when we were viewing the uh, first drugs to put in the um, platform trial, we had set the criteria that they had to hit an important relevant target um, for an ALS. They had to have good preclinical data in at least two models of ALS, whether that was an animal model or a cell-based, and they had to know that their drug got into the brain and acted on the target in people. And so all four of these uh, uh, first four regimens have all of that. So all the, all the science for all four of them is really quite strong. Yeah, I just copied that to all attendees. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I said, sorry about that. Wonderful. Oh, thank you, John. That's a compliment. Um, that you're, asking, you're hoping that it'll come to uh, Spectrum in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I hope so, too. I don't know uh, off the top of my head where we are in Michigan, but hopefully, hopefully close. I, I, can, I can find out what I can. Okay. Yeah, we can do it. I can look real quick. We are at the University of Michigan for sure. 
I'm learning U.S. geography with this um, <laughs> with this work. Yeah, we do have 29 sites up, as you said, and we, we think there's a three more that are super close that should hopefully next week uh, open up. Um, and we are going to send out another call to our Neil sites to add more sites. Um, it does take some time to add new sites from scratch, but we we do think that uh, long term we need to add 10 or 15 more sites on top of the 50 plus that we that we're we're launching with. So we'll be um, really talking with our patient advisory group. Um, to look at the, the, the sites that show interest and to make sure that we, we um, think carefully about geography so we cover areas that aren't covered. And, and actually, um, Molly, could you let me share my screen? Would that be okay? So I can share the, our website so also you, you guys can get familiar with how it works. While you do that, I'll say that Catherine just gave us the, so the um, Spectrum will have what's what we call a site initiation visit in December, mid-December. So a site initiation visit is when their final training and then they can launch. So um, so it's not, not tomorrow, but it's at least it's scheduled, so that's good. And there's a very variety of reasons why it, uh, that affect the timing of it, because they have to have all the other approvals and things in place. But thank you. Right, so basically, if you go to the website, it's organized by state. And as you can see in Michigan, there's three centers, two are enrolling, and one, um, again, will be activated soon. So Harry Ford, University of Michigan, and Spectrum Health. And, and again, it's, it's easy to navigate because you can, um, you know, you can, basically, it's, it's by state. So you just go and see the ones that are enrolling and the ones that are not. But if you call Catherine and Allison, they can tell you uh, sort of estimated timelines. Sure. So um, I'll, there's a couple more questions, and uh, but in the meantime, Catherine, if you could do your magic and are on SUNY, that would be great. There's a question about the SUNY site. Um, so are there concerns that the COVID spikes will slow down recruitment? Sabrina, do you want to answer that first? And then I'll add that. Yeah, I mean, I can just start by saying that uh, the, the, the recruitment that we have had so far is uh, the best we have had in clinical trials ever, really, for ALS. And so it's interesting because we launched in the middle of the pandemic. So I think uh, it's possible to, to continue to enroll. Obviously, you know, it all depends on, on other things that might happen. You know, uh, it's not just COVID and sort of the, what happens in the hospi hospitals. It's also many other things that might be affected by it. And maybe, Merit, you, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I worry all the time, so I do worry a little bit. Um, also, you know, I, I think we did try to set things up so that we could get through another surge, like with the uh, ability to do some of the visits uh, remotely. But all good plans get some bumps. And I think two bumps we're seeing that are also COVID related is that there's a supply chain problem for uh, uh, things that are required for blood draws, like tubes and, um, and needles. and uh, this isn't just affecting ALS trials, it's affecting every trial. Um, so that's one, one challenge. And the other is there's also, a, a, for their people, there's a supply chain problem for nurses to do the home visit. So while we have a, a company that can do them, they're having a hard time finding nurses because all the hospitals obviously are calling in uh, you know, every nurse possible for the COVID. So those two things could slow things down as well. But we're, we're determined to keep you know moving and uh, you know, using all our problem solving skills and, and advice from, from our patient advisory group to, to uh, keep this moving. Um, so there's a question about sites in France and I'll just say, I'm, I'm sorry that we're, it's, we're not in Europe yet. Um, every, every group we spoke to when we were designing this, uh, the platform trial told us that if we really wanted to get off the ground fast, we had to stay, stay simple. Um, and so staying simple here was just one country. Um, but we do, I think, you know, long term want to um, expand. And we, we actually, last couple of days ago, had a talk with the Canadian, our Canadian colleagues about um, expanding to Canada next year. And we are talking to our European colleagues, but I think that's going to be uh, not, not for a while. It adds an enormous amount of complexity and costs. Um, but, but it's a long term plan is to have it as a global. And when would you have the trial results? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I, I, so we expect those to be available for the first four drugs 
by the end of 2021 uh, if the current rate of enrollment continues and we don't encounter unexpected problems because of COVID. Uh, so, so again, that, that really, if, if that really happens and, and you, despite COVID, I mean, it's really truly remarkable because if you think about it, you know, if you've been following ALS trials for a while, it's always, you know, uh, only one trial a year to give results or things like that. We have to, we had to wait for a long time in between trials. Uh, and here we are basically, uh, you know, releasing results of, of many drugs at the same time or roughly the same time, uh, which is really what we were hoping to achieve. And I think, again, we are certainly on track for that. Uh, we'll see what COVID has to say about it, but hopefully we, we will certainly uh, try to do our best and so far so good. Great. And then the question is, how are in-person visits being modified if COVID continues to surge? Yeah, actually, the visits were already modified to account for a COVID surge. In fact, we were originally scheduled to start enrolling in the spring, as you know, but then we pushed it to July because we wanted to make the, the we had to make uh, the, the protocol COVID resilient in, in addition to the fact that obviously the sites were closed in the spring. But, uh, but the good news is that we were able to open with a, a new and improved protocol that's COVID re resilient. So essentially, if uh, there are safety concerns for the participants in a specific geography to go to the site or the site is closed and is on lockdown, then we can do remote visits. Again, with the caveat that uh, Dr. Sukovic was mentioning that now we are experiencing a, a different problem of a shortage of home nurses. Um, so, so again, we're, we're, we, we put all things in, you know, in place that we could uh, do uh, to, to be able to sustain another surge. There might be unexpected um, situations. Um, Spring, I was hoping you might answer this question since you are um, right now um, also having a hat as a site investigator uh, at Jake. Why do some sites reach out to their internal patients not in the order of patients who called at an earlier time to participate? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So I, I, I think every site does it a little bit different. So uh, I should say there are some sites where in general, not just for this trial, but in general, they only enroll people in research, any type of research, if they are patients established at their center. That's some sites. Now, we don't have that policy. So, uh, in fact, we have enrolled participants from all over, um, you know, uh, in previous trials, and, and we continue to stay open for that. So, we are certainly uh, able and willing to, uh, to enroll people who are not our patients. What we are experiencing right now is an extraordinary amount of a level of interest. Um, and, and again, I think that we're still adapting to the fact that we were closed on lockdown with staff redeployment and all of that for a few months. So now we're trying to catch up in a way uh, because there were people who wanted to, to, um, to enroll. Uh, and so, and now we also have to ensure that people can safely come back. Uh, in Massachusetts, where we are, for example, there are some rules about people coming from out of state. Um, and, you know, so, so again, there are some limitations there. And also it's important to discuss, you know, does it make sense for that particular person to, to jump on an airplane, et cetera. So I think it's, it's a combination of sort of volumes, uh, bandwidth, uh, and just also safety concerns and travel restrictions. The other thing, is, and, and um, I think what sites sometimes do is that if if they're seeing someone who might a month from now not be eligible because of maybe the time period or waiting or something, that they sometimes will see them before, and uh, so that so it's not always in the order that someone calls. So right. Um, okay. So uh, does it make sense to enroll in multiple sites? That's a, that's another great question. So I I would suggest that you connect with the patient navigator because part of the the role of of the patient navigator is to try to streamline that process. I would say that you know in a certain geography may, it might make sense. You know if you are a patient at the clinic, maybe to also see where the other clinics stand in terms of activation and enrollment. And and again the navigator one of the things that we want to develop is uh, better communication so that we can really. Um, sort of dispatch uh, people accordingly and based on, on kind of supply and demand. But, um, uh, but again, I, we also would not encourage people to call, you know, several sites uh, because it 
doesn't really help, especially sites that are very far away. Again, there's serious, you know, travel significant travel restrictions. And so the, the likelihood of, of being, you know, enrolled in a, in a very far away state, um, you know, when, where you're not established clinically, you know, is, is low also might not be a good idea in general. So I'm gonna answer um, one of these other questions, which is, um, really i think a comment about hearing that the results might not be available until end of 2021 and that that's a far away so i'll say what, what really drives uh, when it's going to be available is is the enrollment rate and it's been so fantastic right the sooner we're done enrolling these four regiments the sooner we'll have the results to all four and again in a traditional trial we would only have one so again we're going to know four results next uh after the fall but it you know, really, it's it's basically six months plus a little bit of time from when the last person enrolls. And right now, we're we're thinking at the current rate, you know, maybe we can start enrolling in April, early April. But that could change as we get more sites open. But again, it could change the other direction if COVID really slows things down. But what I hear you, we're, we want to be on a fast time frame. But it's um, right now the FDA won't allow, and and then we don't think we can get an answer if we don't. Uh, and that's a big change. They used to require trials that were 12 months or 18 months. Um, but, but anyway, this still is, is so much faster, but we, we always want to improve. Um, the other thing I'll just say about that is that we do have interim looks at the data about every three months. So there's a blind, an unblinded data safety mining board. And they could stop an arm um, if it's futile, meaning that if there's no chance that it would work. Um, that's important because a lot of studies don't have that in. We thought that was really important because we don't want to waste anybody's time. Um, so, that so there's um, a question about whether we can share the slides. And I, I think yeah, and they are actually on the website. I just checked right now <laughs> to confirm. Yes, they are on the website and they are downloadable as a PDF. In addition to the, you know, you can also watch the video recording. Uh, we generally, it takes one or two days after every, you know, one day, I think by Friday or Monday the latest, you should have this one as well. There's two questions about the, the new drug, the regimen D, the Prodopidine. One is uh, when, it's, when we're going to start having that as an option and the other is uh, what we hope it will do. And so we're, we're targeting December for opening that up. We're, we're doing that kind of last minute things to make sure that we, we get the drug to the sites and that the sites are all trained for that, but that's our target. Um, you know, this is the first trial of this drug in AOS in people. So we don't know obviously what it's going to do, but again, the preclinical data suggests that it could uh, really protect motor neurons. And then there, uh, Sabrina, there's a question. Is there any information on the EAP? Yeah, so we, we do have a page on our website with some information about uh, our EAP program. Um, as if you attend the previous webinar, we did explain a little bit. We could spend more time maybe next week. Uh, we, um, we, we have um, done a few small EAPs at Mass General uh, over the last couple of years. And now the goal is to significantly expand that and also expand to other sites. Uh, so uh, right now we are in the process of setting up additional EAPs that could be done in collaboration with other centers as well. Um, so again, we're, we're literally in the process of fundraising, uh, organizing things and, and you know, setting this up. So I'm hoping that um, you know, in, in, 20, in early 2021, we'll have more of those. They're still gonna be small, but the, the hope is that you know, we're gonna plant these seeds and then we will continue to grow. Yeah. Is there a wait time to get into a new trial right after you complete the existing one? Yes, it's a it's a washout for safety uh, of the drug. So in other words, you need to wait for the previous experimental drug to be out of your system. And that's definitely generally defined as 30 days or five half-lives. So what that means is that different drugs can stay in your body longer and others, you know, wash out very quickly. So uh, if the half-life is known, we will go by that. To be quite honest, for most experimental drugs, we don't fully know the half-life, so we do have a cutoff at 30 days. Uh, again, unless the, the drug is well described and we know the half-life. Uh, if not, it's a 30-day washout. Thank you, everybody. I think we got throughout the questions. They're really great questions. Um, and we hope to see some of you again next week and we'll have a different set of topics. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good rest of your week. Bye.